Thank you very much. Welcome back to the afternoon session of the Science Symposium. At this moment, we will resume our presentations. At this moment, we are going to have Dr. Martin Franksen, and he will be presenting on the risk factors associated with anosmia and aquasia, aquasia amidst COVID-19 in a Northern Caribbean country. At this time, we welcome Dr. Franksen, and we ask him to start the presentation. Thank you very much. Not seeing it. Okay. Uh, fine. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. The work that I'm going to present to you this afternoon will be um, the results of two years or so of work that was done while I was teaching in the Bahamas and guiding um, some of our doctoral folks. Those others, the, the person who I was guiding is Dr. Nina Thompson, and um, others who were of similar help were Alfonso Blake, Nikia Forbes, and Sabrike Pinder Butler. We heard a lot of fancy terms during the COVID pandemic. One of them was RT PCR, which is, as you see, is reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, SARS CoV 2 with a severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus type 2, um, COVID-19, and WHO, CDC, PAHO, those are names you know very well. PMH, you know of the one in, Monte in uh, Morant Bay. We do have a Princess Margaret Hospital in Nassau, Bahamas as well. In fact, wherever Princess Margaret went, when the British was trying to break up that relationship between her and uh, her then lover. Uh, they named it Princess Margaret Hospital. So you'll have one in Australia, wherever, the, wherever she went. That, such was the power of the British Empire at the time. AED, we just usually say emergency, but it's, the proper term is accident and emergency department. And um, there is actually a clinic in the Bahamas that is a very comprehensive clinic called the South Beach Clinic, as well as the Princess Margaret Hospital, both places were the main places that brought, uh, people would go to in Nassau, in the Bahamas, for care with relationship to things related to that pandemic. The New Providence is really the island. Nassau is the capital of the country, but it's just um, a small part of New Providence. And New Providence is 21 miles long and seven miles wide. And um, don't be fooled though, when you put all of the Bahamas islands together, they're really quite a big land mass. Um, but they, don't, they are not together. They're sprinkled as an archipelago across the Caribbean, just north of the Turks and Caicos Island and um, northeast of Cuba. And um, that is where this study was done. And the but majority of the people, of course, live in New Providence Island there and Nassau. Um, <clears throat> Anosmia and agusia are pathognomonic features of the COVID-19 patient. And uh, it was Deher who noted that uh, and reported in 2020 that this was a, a feature of it. Anosmia meaning lack of smell and agusia lack of taste. And then you have Hypoosmia, which is a diminishing of smell, and hypogusia, which is a diminishing of taste. And then you have dysosmia and dysgusia, which are hallucinations around smelling and taste, such as the brain, 
And um, <clears throat> one of the things that we noticed that it occurred in 25% of persons who didn't have any other features when it came to anosmia, and um, about 26% for anosmia and 23% for agusia, averaging out 25% when you put the two features together. And they often occurred together. Um, <clears throat> it is itself sufficient to justify you remember, those of us who were compliant with the requirements, just having those two things was sufficient to justify you being isolated during the pand pandemic in that quarantine period that was um, there. And oftentimes, however, it does get accompanied by symptoms like cough and chill and fever, sore throat, shortness of breath and difficulty in breathing, and of course, muscle pain as the virus rips through the human body. And there it is. It's usually a temporary condition, the anosmia, or a few people may have it up to this day after having the first episode in 2020. There are other people who have had this problem, anosmia and agusia, long before the pandemic. Some people will remember having a cold many, many decades ago and still their taste and their smell is, is um, disfigured. We went through the standard ways of um, looking at the literature, and um, we were able to find enough literature on this. And um, this is the one for Agusia. Actually, we thought we had a great a bonanza of articles, over 500. However, really what turned out was just 58 of those articles related to what we have uh, as re, um, focusing on helping us with this particular study. Uh, literature review is very important because it helps you to stand on the shoulders of those who have done the work before. And we did that. And not only did we look in the journals, we also looked into a reputable textbook as well and also sought the consultation of an infectious disease expert. As we were going through the literature, search terms that we used included, of course, anosmia and agusia, and of course, the things that we mentioned earlier on, and um, SARS-CoV and so forth. Endang looked at, um, in a systematic review, well, over several thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, 107 studies. You remember, people were just turning in literature during the early parts of the pandemic. And we found that um, when it comes to anosmia, lack of smell, about one in three, 37, 38% of persons who have, are COVID positive will have this, one in three persons. And the, the same was basically true for um, dysgusia as well, which is the um, disfigurement of the taste the, uh, of the, um, yeah, the taste there. And um, Passarelli et, et, et al. really helped us to see that in a very large study, um, it was a wide range of experiences. In some populations, only 5%, as one in 20 people would have this. And in another set, four out of five people would have it. So it's really dependent upon the type of people and the age groupings and so on and several other social factors. And um, just to move on in the interest of time. And oftentimes, they, most times they would occur together, but uh, and, and on rare occasions, they would actually occur separately. This study was actually done to help us to gain insights into what do we do with this set of patients who are now coming at us with loss of smell and loss of taste. How could we possibly help them? And um, we had looked at many global studies and um, none were actually coming from the Caribbean. And so, especially the Bahamas where I was at the time, drove us to go after that. We felt that what we would have found was about 30%, three out of 10 people, 
That's what we felt after reluting literature and looking at what we got as a clinical sense of what was coming to the clinic as with regards to patients reporting their symptoms. And um, we thought at the time that there might be differences depending on whether they were male or female. And we thought that more females would have had this than males. And, um, you know, we thought that most people would say that within about four day, day four of feeling sick, they would get that, or even up to say day seven. And that um, by a month's time, most of these people, it would have been gone. Um, so we aim to determine the risk factors associated with this and um, basically to see whether the risk factors change depending upon the portals of, uh, of entry of, of where you, where, where you, where you, um, you, you, uh, you, you got it or exposed as well as your socio-demographic features, whether you were male versus female or whether you were married versus single versus divorced, et cetera. We even tried to get some economic, socioeconomic information as to whether it was poorer people getting it than rich people, et cetera, and um, such it was. We looked at um, as many features as we could look, broke them down. Uh, when you look at specific objectives, we wanted to see what was the prevalence, of course, of these two things. Um, and also the duration, but we also wanted to see what were the risk factors that were associated and to assess the, um, if we could control for um, the risk factors together and actually come to see if they were different for males, for, for females, if they were different for those who had hypertension versus diabetes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, the medical socio-demographic factors. Well, <clears throat> I told you a little bit about the harmers already, and um, the fact that about 70% of the population actually lives in New Providence, and uh, we had a lot of COVID cases, over 10,000 in that time of the study that we looked at, and we could have looked at even more too, but we decided to um, just focus it on that for the years that we were considering. And you will remember that the disease started to change in the clades. We had alpha and the beta and the delta and so on and so forth. So we did it as in, a, in a period when we thought the change was not as much so that we could actually look at some of the risk factors. Because you might remember that when we dealt, when we came down to Omicron, etc., some of them, they were now telling us that those don't produce as much loss in smell and taste as the original alpha and beta and so forth. So it was important for us to do that. As I said, two, two institutions were available to us for this study. And the study design that we use was a case control study design. The reason that we use a case control study design was um, there is no way we were going to get a whole group of people and then have one group that we exposed to COVID-19 and another group that we don't. Nobody would approve that study. So what we did was we saw people who already became cases and then we tried to see people who did not become cases. And we did that not so much by whether you had COVID-19 or not, but by we just looked at all the COVID-19 persons, ignored the COVID-19 negative persons, and just in the positive persons, the cases we saw, we, we, who we'd call a case was whether you had agusia and anosmia, because that was, that's what we were focusing on at the time. And if you were not a case, even though you were positive for COVID, we would call it a control. And um, this was... Um, data that was done, uh, collected um, in that period that was mentioned there. All participants were adults, and the selection approach that we had was one where the government had restricted it so that you could only come to the accident emergency at Princess Margaret or at the South Beach Clinic. And um, those places were designated to handle the condition. You were included if you had the condition, if you were an adult, any sex, you spoke English because our questionnaire that we were going to interview them with 
was in English, so they had to be English speaking, even if they were of Haitian or other descent. And um, resident in the Bahamas who didn't want to see tourists coming and getting into our study because that wouldn't be typical of the population that we were studying. And of course, if you were mentally ill or um, incarcerated for ethical reasons, and of course, we did a telephone interviewing, a random digit dial telephone interviewing, and if we couldn't have reached you, we would not be able to get you and therefore exclude you by default. When you do a case control study, the considerations really center around um, your sample size and being influenced by things like whether you want the study to be a one-to-one -one, um, ratio of cases to controls or what do you want the odds ratios, what do you think the odds ratios will be? And an odds ratio is just basically the, the, um, the occurrence pattern of the disease in those who, uh, of the, um, not the disease, of the risk factors in those who have the disease versus the occurrence pattern of those with um, out the risk, without the disease, what is their occurrence pattern of the risk factors. It's not so intuitive. We're not looking to see when you're exposed to whatever, will it cause anosmia? We're actually looking to see, okay, so you have anosmia already, so what is your odds of having certain risk factors? That's what we're looking at. And it's what the best we can do when we cannot do a prospective study. And so we considered all of that using this formula and we ended up with the requirement being that we needed 523 people to do our study. Um, we actually ended up with about 100 less, a few less than that, um, but still strong enough numbers that we would be able to do the, the, the various things that we had to do to analyze the situation. We got the requisite ethics approval and permission and voluntary consent was obtained as we interviewed people by telephone calling them, random digit dialing. We created a list of telephone numbers based upon the persons who had come to these two places. We were able to have their information so we could get their telephone numbers and then we randomly randomized who we would call so there would some uh, as much as possible um, reduction in what we call selection bias. And in many instances, it worked out very, very well. We used a 39-item data, data collection instrument where we would collect not only their social demographic characteristics, but also their medical characteristics as well. Um, symptoms, including chills and fevers and so forth that they would tell us about, and whether they had anosmia or agusia, and when it started and when it ended, so we could get an idea of the duration, and whether or not they had treatment, and we made sure that their names were not in the analysis or in the reporting of anything. And um, the, in a, uh, the, the, the part that was related to really what we were concerned with was a 17-item anosmia reporting tool um, that was validated by the American Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgeons Association, and um, we did get permission from them to do to use that instrument, and we did a pilot testing of it as well on ten persons, and it worked fine. The <clears throat> information once it, once we had gotten successful interviews was entered in standard software packages and analyzed with the latest version of the time of the IBM SPSS, which was version 29, statistical analysis application software. And um, throughout, the Bahamas is a small place, relatively speaking, so a lot of people know each other. And so 
confidentiality becomes an extremely important thing, and we did everything to uphold the confidentiality throughout the process in how we handled the interviews, how we handled the data that we collected and the results that we, we got, make sure that everything was properly handled and kept secure. We used standard statistical approaches, and um, I invite you to tomorrow's presentation at the nursing symposium when I will expand a little bit on some of the fun ways in which you can include statistics in your um, research and enjoy it. Most people think of statistics as a horrible thing, but basically it's not. It's just a way of summarizing our findings, and so we did descriptive statistics where we would look at things like um, the mean mode and um, percentages and so on, and Every time we looked at such point estimates, we would also calculate the variation around that, the average variation around that. So we would come up with standard deviations for the mean interquartile ranges for the, mode, for the, um, for the median, and of course, a range of percentage uh, confidence intervals and so on for the mode. Because the, the, the modes usually would report, be reported in like percentages. These are some of the tests that we used for the various um, things that we had to analyze, and um, <clears throat> no, the study was a minimal risk, we think, and um, now for the results. We ended up with 659 participants being invited, telephone interviewing. Remember, we needed 523, so we thought that we would, in reaching out to 600, and almost 700 people, we would get enough, but in the end, we ended up with a 71% response rate, which as inter telephone interviewings go, this was very good. So the mean age of participants in our study were 44.9 years old, but you could see there's a slight amount of skewing to this, so maybe um, that was the not the true average. The average would probably be more like 44 years old, period, that, rather than 44.9, but not that much difference between the mean and the median. But we did have that one person who was 100 years old. You know those people, right? That one person who was 100 years old, clear faculty, and answered the phone, and we had to interview them. And so there he was up there. Um, we had more females than males. Um, 50-something percent females, 48 percent males. It was statistically significantly different, but from a practical point of view, it was roughly 50-50. Uh, we felt like we had a good representation of both sexes, and the two big situations are married versus single, and we think we had enough of those as well. We did have, out of um, the 47 persons, we had 391 persons who were not healthcare workers. And we had 74 who were healthcare workers, and that's important because they are particularly at high risk, and we are glad we didn't get 10 and 15 and so, we got well over 30, which is about 74. So we were able to do some useful statistics on that. And uh, most folks were, um, on average, high school educated or college educated. And um, when it came to employment, most of the folks were actually full-time workers. And uh, that's basically the same thing all over again. And a little more than a quarter of the persons, as we said, 16% of them were healthcare workers. And um, then we had the, those who were in between. And when it came to their medical conditions, the big medical condition was obesity. Um, by far, as you can see, the bottom bar in that Pareto chart is the, 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 the big underlying condition medically was obesity. Overweight was, uh, 137 of them had overweight too. So between obesity and overweight, that was the big underlying condition. Um, and hypertension was a big chronic condition, followed by diabetes, and sinusitis followed next. So that was interesting to us, because we wanted to have enough people who had sinusitis and so on to see if people who have had a long history of 
nose and throat infections would be the ones who would have more so of the loss of smell and the loss of taste. And um, we also looked at their smoking history. And uh, the, we found that um, we have a little typo here. There's no sex that is email. It's actually female, okay? So females, 8% um, of them, 3% uh, of them, 8 females we found who smoke. And, um, but males, six, remember, there were even less males than females, right? But more males by far smoked. One out of every three males um, who answered our telephone call smoked. And... Um, one in, 20, one in five of our females drank alcohol, whereas one in two of our males drank alcohol. So these things became important things for us to say, are they possible risk factors? And um, <clears throat> we also looked at where were you when you, just before you thought you got, or where do you think you might have gotten your COVID-19 from? 168 said close contact. 31 said travel related, and these don't add up to the full thing because some people said both. And um, just bear that in mind. In the end, remember we had said we had hypothesized that about 30% of the persons would have had the anosmia and um, agusia. In the end, we actually were not too far off. Of the 456, 106 um, had anosmia and agusia, and I remember I said they, those two usually happen together. Um, however, 21 persons, you know, had just the anosmia by itself, and uh, of course, the opposite of those would be your um, 441, who would have had the um, no anosmia, and that's, those would serve as our controls. Uh, when we looked at Agusia, what did I just do a while ago? Oh, no, no for Agusia now, we had um, pretty similar figures, 106. Remember for Anosmia, it was 106. And for Agusia, the 106 there had both. And 16 participants had Agusia only, whereas it was 21 who had Anosmia only. And of course, the, the, the control groups were almost the same. And um, <clears throat> when did you experience the onset of the symptoms? 86% of them said, right, at the beginning of their not feeling well, they noticed that they had no smell. And um, one in five of them said, midway in their illness. And... Uh, when it came to agusia, loss of taste, nine, nine out of 10 of them said at the beginning, even a little bit higher, but not statistically that much different. And um, several of them said midway in the illness as well. But 2.5% of them said at the end. People went for testing, and we would ask, "Did you? How many? How many of you had anosmia before you went for your testing? Was it one of those things that helped you to drive you to go for testing?" And three quarters of them said yes, and um, the other quarter said they did it. They got it after testing. The ones who had anosmia, and um, the. So three quarters of them, and basically 74% had the loss of smell occurred before other symptoms as well. And for agusia, as I showed you before, nine, nine out of 10, even higher, said they had the loss of taste just prior to um, going for the testing. And uh, some of them could not remember. And um, then, a lot of our study, because it's a telephone interviewing, was um, self-reported. And uh, the median duration that they reported to us um, was about six days of them having anosmia. I myself had it, 
And I would agree with this, that it, it came around after about a week, and it then slowly improved. And for me, I'm fully recovered. For some others, a few others, they still have the ongoing anosmia. Um, when it comes to the loss, loss of taste, the same is true. It's about five days, not six days. And um, the rest of it is pretty similar pattern as well. Well, um, we looked at a variety of risk factors, and I will tell you more about those, but I want to hasten something to do something that I normally don't do, which is to tell you what we found in the end. In the end, we found that the real things of all the risk factors that we're considering, smoking and whether you had sinusitis and so on, the real things that were the biggest predictors were not those things actually. Although we did find that those things by themselves did predict whether you had loss of smell or loss of taste, the real thing was whether you had a fever or whether you had a cough with it or tiredness or headaches. And remember now, this is self-reported, so that's part of the limitation of the study. And so we did a multiple regression analysis that basically told us that if you look at the odds ratios, that if you had a fever, you were 65 times more likely to have um, a loss of taste than if you did not have a fever. You see that's 65.4? If you had tiredness, you were 20 times more likely than if you didn't feel tired. If you had cough, you were about 26 times more likely than you if you didn't. If you had a headache, you were three to three to four times more likely. And um, remember, we're predicting now loss of taste. So we also said, I wonder if you also had anosmia, which is loss of smell. If you had loss of smell, um, how, much, how much were you more likely? 43 times more likely. Now we look at just the loss of taste now. Um, I have to, um, there's, there's a little bit of typo there. But basically, for, for, loss of, for the, uh, looking at it the other way around now, it's the same set of symptoms. It's the same set of symptoms. And th this here would be for anosmia. And that, as you can see, it's the same basic set. It's fever, headaches, et cetera, et cetera. And um, now, as I move into the discussion to wrap this up, I just, I will bring up some other results, which is not the traditional way to do things, but I want to do it this way for a particular purpose. I made an exception to the rule on, in this case here. Um, the rest of it I have commented on here, so I'll just move along. Others found, Kloppenstein also found that it was mostly females who presented compared to males in their study as well. and. Um, we also had similar findings at Lee, et cetera, with what we, and our findings were kind of pretty close to what we had hypothesized. And uh, we thought, uh, Patel thought, found a little bit of a longer duration of loss of smell um, and, than taste. We didn't see that much of a difference. And uh, we had, 30% uh, of participants saying that close contact is how they think they got it. W Patel found that three quarters of their participants said that it was with close contact. I don't know, maybe the Bahamian people just got scared and were very compliant and stayed far from each other. But I remember the pictures from Portmore and it was the opposite. They were to say six something apart, but I, I, I know in the Bahamas we were trying six feet apart, but I remember pictures coming from Portmore, it was six millimeters apart. And um, I was shocked. I said, my Jamaican people. Well, not too much the worse for all of that. Less than 10% said that they had a travel history, 
And um, it was pretty much like what they had around the rest of the world. About 5% thought they get it from the, got it from the work site. And um, there were those who just did not know where they might have gotten this, uh, maybe about 30%. And um, when it came to where you got it, we didn't see any big differences between whether you were at anosmia or whether you had agusia. But then again, most of our patients who had anosmia had agusia, so that's not a surprising finding. As I said, many of our persons were overweight, etc. Patil, etc., et um, had about, in their study, 26% um, were overweight or obese and with the, with the loss of smell and loss of taste, etc. So we, our findings were pretty similar, and also that they had both respectively hypertension and diabetes, whether you had loss of smell or loss of taste. 26% um, of them who had hypertension had loss of smell, and 22.4% of those who had diabetes. We saw interesting associations, and uh, we saw that age mattered when it came to you having an osmia and agusia. As you got older, you were more likely to have those particular features. We think we know, we understand the biology of it now, and that the, 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 um, the ACE2 inhibitors are more prominent. This, the virus locks onto the cells in more people who are older, and we think that that's just a natural phenomenon there. I see people trying to wrap me up, and I will do my best to come to a conclusion soon. And um, so we did see a relationship by sex. We saw one where we thought that the females were at more at risk of getting this problem than males. So that's the gender association. Remember I said earlier on that when we did the multivariate analysis, it didn't matter that much by gender. What more mattered was whether you had fevers and chills and all of that. But when you just took out the sex alone and related it to them, we found a pattern there. And um, the females tend to have it more at the beginning of the illness than the males, etc. Rose right to at the end of the illness, it was more so males. And um, when it came to did people who have neurological problems also have it, what we found was that there was a weak relationship, a quite weak relationship in, between anosmia and whether you had neurological problems. As you know, the nerve to your nose and goes directly to the brain. It's very close to your brain. And um, so we did see that. And Lichtenstein ha had the same thing as well. And um, smoking, we found a very interesting thing. We found that the smokers had less anosmia and agusia than the non-smokers. Go figure that out. Others found, like Iqbal and so forth, found the opposite. So more research is needed there. And uh, when it came to um, the multivariate ones, we talked about that already. Our study has limitations, that I must confess. And um, it was a self-reported test. We did not do any actual testing of their olfaction and their gustation, test, taste tests and smell tests. Uh, we couldn't. They were over, it was over a telephone interview. So there would have been recall bias, selection bias, response bias, and um, they would have been looking at life after having the sickness. And you know that when that happens, people sometimes make up stories in their minds. And um, there was a lockdown period that were variable and various other things that could do there. The uh, bottom line that I would like to end with is really loss of smell and loss of taste, the impact of the virus is so powerful that it overwhelmed whether you are a smoker or not, or whether you're drunk or not, or your age and all of those things. All of those things just went in comparison to 
the invasion and the impact of the virus, the viremia, on ourselves. And so, maybe we need further studies. I don't know that we'll get the opportunity again to do that. And, uh, but I hope that we don't have the opportunity again to do that. But they tell us that disease X could come at any time. So brace yourselves and live healthily and uh, do what you can to mitigate the effects of the virus on you, which means the usual preventive methods and judicious proper vaccinations. Comply with immunizations. On our side as scientists, we should comply with making sure that those immunizations are safe, etc., and that is an ongoing process. Those who did immunizations fared far better than those who didn't. Are immunizations imperfect? They're not perfect yet, but they're far more perfect than dying. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. All right. Great. I'm going to disconnect this. We want to thank Dr. Frankson for his wonderful presentation. Uh, we want to encourage as you go to the information that you would have become more knowledgeable on the area and at this time we won't be able to take any questions because we are way behind time so we are going to ask for your consideration at this moment we're going to ask dr mitchell to come forward as he presents he is the next presenter thank you very much dr mitchell All right, good afternoon, everyone. No, you have to do better than that. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes. For the next few moments, I want to present a paper entitled Privacy and Security Concerns Associated with M Health Technologies, a Computational Social Science Approach. Let me ask a question. Uh, can I see a show of hands, those who are wearing a smartwatch? or something smart, or something half smart. Uh, all right, so I see a few hands going up um, of persons you know, who are probably wearing these smart devices. Now, this study uh, was done in tandem with Professor Omar el Gea from the Dakota State University. And uh, for the next few moments, I want this to guide uh, our presentation, uh, as you would have seen it represented on the screen. Now, the M Health market uh, at the end of 2020 was projected at about 35.7 billion uh, in terms of the market value. We're talking about M Health in the context of your smartwatches, you name it. However, by 2027 or 2025, it is projected that the value, the market value, will be just about 332.7 billion in terms of the market share for these M Health devices, which suggests that most, if not all, will soon own their own smartwatches or other wearable devices. So let us now define what exactly is M Health. Because if we're looking at M Health and the different security and privacy concerns, we need to know what exactly is M Health. According to the World Health Organization 2011, and I quote, M Health is seen as the medical and public health practice supported by mobile devices such as your mobile phones, patient monitoring systems, personal digital assistance, and other wireless devices. However, Cos et al. Um, 2016 
gave another definition where it was shared that M Health can be seen as the use of mobile technologies to include wearables, implantables, environmental or portable type devices that, use, that persons can use to monitor or manage their own health. So for this study, uh, we, we sought to investigate the various privacy and security concerns expressed by social media users in relation to the utilization of mHealth technologies. And as was uh, presented earlier, we utilize what we call the computational social science approach. There are three research questions which were, which were um, addressed during this study. One, what are the privacy and security concerns associated with mHealth technologies? Two, what is the general sentiment towards mHealth privacy and security related issues? And three, how has the perception of various mHealth related issues evolved over time? So, uh, I just want you to know that with the enormous potentials of mHealth technologies to increase the health healthcare quality, expand access to service, and even to improve one's personal wellness, there are many challenges inherent with this particular technology. Uh, according to Almin et al., uh, it was pointed out that there are still significant privacy and security challenges with these, um, or with this particular technology. Uh, Khan et al. and Lee et al., 2013 and 2015 respectively, stated that there's a privacy problem where there's a barrier to this persistent adoption of these mHealth technologies such as the wearables. And the last one I want to cite here is Zhou 20, uh, 2012 where it was postulated that privacy concerns and perceptions of security risks can hinder the usage location-based uh, services of these technologies. I want to now speak about the research methodology employed uh, during this study. And now you can imagine that this is not really a health presentation, but more a computer science type presentation. So uh, for this study, uh, we adopted from Al Ramani uh, et al. 2016, there is this approach in which uh, there's a combination of what we call text mining and grounded theory. So there's a, there's a combination of text mining and grounded theory, which they are said to be compatible. Why? Because text mining allows us to extract what we call concepts or theories from the data. So how did we go about this? The chart on screen shows that first we had to issue what we call a search query. There was a platform called the Brand Watch platform. Now, this platform uh, is plugged into what we call the Twitter firehose. And most of us, uh, before Twitter, we know, well, now we have X, but before X, we had Twitter. So we were using tweets as the basis for our data, um, data source. All right? And from, from this uh, exercise using the Twitter firehose, we looked at data from 2010 up to um, 2022. And then from this process, we, we performed a, a concept known as lemmatization, which is we removed all the, the, the noise from the data, bringing it into a state that we could uh, readily assess uh, using what we call term frequency um, inverse document frequency model. Um, which is a weighting scheme that is ascribed to different texts as the themes and the concepts emerged. The, the algorithm that was used is called the latent Dirichlet allocation algorithm. Uh, this algorithm is really a topic modeling type algorithm. So uh, for those who have heard about data mining or machine learning, this algorithm is based on, on that principle. So what was done here is that from the topic models, we had these statistical algorithms that were used to discover what we call thematic structures um, in, these, in this large unstructured corpus or data set um, of the documents that we were analyzing. And from this, we went to the area of, of doing manual coding. Now, it's always good. We always talk about triangulation. It's always very important when it comes to, to this type of study to not only go from the quantitative side, which we're using the, the, the statistical algorithm giving us all the term frequency distribution, but 
We also had to do, um, using atlas.ti, uh, we actually um, imported about a thousand of the tweets and we did some manual coding just to make sure that there were some corroboration with the, the, the data re uh, returned from our algorithm compared with what we were seeing um, from the qualitative uh, um, analysis tool. Now, one, one of the things we, we saw to do here is to, to, as best as possible, eliminate bias. Because, you know, bias is always a concern when we, when we have our studies. So how did we address this? Uh, there were two independent researchers, and what we did, we reviewed uh, the topics that were generated by this algorithm. And then from our assessment, the, the inter-rate agreement, or CAPA, for those who have done the, the stats, you'd have heard about the CAPA, um, and, and the value for kappa was just about um, 0.8, uh, which suggests that there was almost perfect agreement between the two authors. All right? After that, we, were, we did what we call sentiment analysis, and we also did some emotional analysis using the Ekman 6 uh, approach to measure emotions as to better understand how persons were, were the perception of individuals when it comes to security and privacy in the M Health um, uh, sector. The final step in our research methodology is what we call data analysis. So we had, from the grounded theory perspective, we looked at axial coding, and then from axial coding, we have selected code, selective coding, and then we had trend analysis, and all of these combined to give us our final results. Just before I share some of the results from this study, um, on the screen now, you'll get an idea as to what the search, the search terms or the search query um, um, looks like. So it's not a lot of C++ and Java. It's really um, using natural language processing. So we're just writing the, the keywords in English and asking Brandwatch to you know, uh, 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 crawl the Twitter firehose and then give us the associated uh, results. So let me go ahead now and share some of the resu results from this study. As you know, tweets, these are short sentence um, type texts. So we had to examine them with our inclusion and exclusion um, criteria to see which tweets can we include, um, which tweets are within content and context of what we are actually trying to, to, to do. And the chart here gives a nice spread of the tweets that were um, analyzed. Uh, in this particular phase of the study, about 25,000 tweets um, were analyzed with the bulk of, of, the, of, of the concerns being around 2013 to about 2016, and I'll tell you why momentarily. In terms of the spread for, for the tweets um, that were, were assessed, we, uh, the United States had about 54% of the tweets that were returned from the fire hose, um, the United Kingdom about 17%, and um, the next in line would have been Canada with about 6% um, of, of the, the data. In terms of uh, the demographics, we had about 68% uh, uh, males and 32% females. I always thought females tweet will send more tweets than males, but maybe that's not the case. But in this study, we had more males who were expressing these concerns, uh, um, these security and privacy concerns. Let us look at the first research question and just quickly summarize uh, the key findings. So the first research question examined the privacy and security concerns of social media users in the context of mHealth technologies. So from the latent Derrick um, algorithm, uh, it returned what we call word clouds. You may have seen word clouds already using the term frequency um, approach. So what it does, it will highlight those terms with high frequencies. So for example, in the first era, it has capture and datum as keywords that, that came up from, 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 from that assessment. So as the researchers, we have to now ascribe a particular word that best describes what this word cloud is saying. So we would have all agreed as researchers that this word cloud demonstrates personal data capture. We had one that covered surveillance, um, etc. So all we're doing at this point, we're looking at the top 15 weighted words within the data set for each um, of, of the distributions. And then from there, we would have assigned an associated topic. What, we, what followed from this was coming up with four privacy theoretical dimensions. Because if you're doing a study, you want that, uh, especially if it's in a qualitative standpoint, we talk about these theoretical um, frameworks or dimensions. So there are four theoretical dimensions 
that were uh, that that evolved as we as we did this study. Uh, one, we had information uh, processing, or um, we also had information dissemination. We had data invasion, information processing, information collection. So the first one was information collection, and what we found is that users were concerned about surveillance, tracking, location tracking. Uh, the personal data capture, uh, uh, the policies, not having sufficient policies. May I ask for a, a show of hands? If there's somebody inside here who would have signed up for an, uh, a website or an application and you saw 20 pages of privacy statements and you sat and read it. Let me see a show of hands. Let me see that faithful person. Oh, one person. Nobody. I don't know. We just click accept not reading um, the, the policies. And what persons were saying that there's a major concern because with, 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 the, with the idea of information collection, there needs to be proper policies. But you know what was also a concern from the study? Third-party applications. Using mHealth, these mHealth um, tools, there are many third-party applications that one will, will actually install. So you want some additional features? There's a third-party application. However, with the third-party application, they are now capturing our information in the background, and then you don't know where to send in the information, you don't know what they're using it for, you don't know how much money they're making from it, and that, all of those must be guided by policy. In the context of information processing, we have misuse of data, um, distrust of company. Uh, so, so, for example, um, Google, no, nobody trusts Google with their data, for example. So, so they were saying, we don't trust these, these, these companies who have monopolized data to keep my data because they're going to um, use it in ways that they so choose. Data breach was another concern. And again, how third parties are actually accessing the data. Uh, and then the last one I want to mention here, as we sought to map the security concerns under these four theoretical frameworks, um, the data invasions, uh, data theft, lack of data protection, all of these are, were concerns that were raised um, by the users uh, of these mHealth uh, devices. All right, let me hop over here to research question number two. The findings in terms of research question number two. So in research question number two, we looked at the sentiment towards mHealth privacy and security related issues. Now, from uh, earlier I mentioned we use the Ekman 6 approach to measure the emotional side of these users. So anger, fear, disgust, joy, surprise, sadness, Ekman 6 approach. Now, what was found from this stage of the analysis was that about 67% of the posts analyzed reflected anger and fear, which really shows that most of these users had a major concern when it comes to their security and their privacy with using these wearables, or as we may call them in the broader standpoint, the internet of things, these connected um, devices. Uh, so that's, that's one of the, the, the areas uh, that we would have seen. In terms of the, the sentiment uh, analysis that was done, it showed that about 71% uh, of the posts were classified as negative, while 29% had a positive uh, uh, tone. And when I, when I was looking at the data and I was using the, the AI tool to analyze with the, the data mining and everything, looking at it, I wondered how could 71% um, have negative sentiments to, to the utilization of mHealth in, 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 in their everyday lives, but there was a 29% who thought otherwise. You know what I found out? That the 29% um, indicated users that were ambivalent towards privacy and the security concerns. Because even though they would have expressed some concerns, they had some positive messages within that tweet. So, so those were not seen as fully negative, but they were more on the positive side with one or two thoughts that could be conveyed as being negative. The research question number three looked at the perception of various mHealth-related issues and how these would have evolved over time. And what was found here is that, um, as you can see the, the chart in question, between 2013 and 2017, 
we saw a flurry of discussions about privacy. And in, about, in, in around 2015, uh, there was a spike. When I did further checks, I realized that this was a time when Google purchased Fitbit. So Google purchased Fitbit and person was saying, all my Fitbit data will now go to Google. So they were, we, there, there was so much buzz going around when Google purchased Fitbit. And that, 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 that was shown um, as, we, as we did further, further analysis of, of the data. What, what came out from, from this study? There were several dominant, dominant themes uh, that, that emerged from, from this study. So, so for example, um, let me just go back here a second. All right, so some of the dominant themes, uh, the company use of, of data, can't see that screen, but the company use of data, surveillance came out as 22%. Now, do you know, I mean, it's a research week, so I can tell you, do you know that even when you turn off the location tracker or tracking feature on your phone, you're not safe? Or you turn off the location, but it still told you you went to Montego Bay. But I know it's off. Because there are other third-party applications in the background that's tracking us and in the context of surveillance. And that was an, an obvious issue and concern expressed by the users of these uh, mobile health type, type devices. Um, the, the next area that really came up was users wanted to have control obvious control over their wearables. They wanted to have that experience so they could control their wearables and they don't want to know that the companies are the ones that have 100% control of your data because you're in trouble. They can sell it, they can make money from it, they can do whatever. And that is an obvious concern from users of these mobile health uh, devices. All right, so I was told to... Okay, I won't tell you what this. <laughs> all right, so I was, I was going high speed because I know I, all my time was gone. But let's, I'm going to wrap up now. Yes, sir, I'm at conclusion. <laughs> so I'm, I'm right in line to, to finish quickly. All right, conclusions from, from the study. <laughs> all right, so in terms of, of um, this study, as it was mentioned before, we use that computational science um, approach which, where we leverage the capability of text mining within the context of grounded theory. And we were seeking to better understand the user-reported privacy and security concerns associated with mHealth devices. Um, theoretically, the findings from this study uh, provide evidence that several areas, information collection, processing, dissemination, are all affected by unclear or lack of um, policies. Um, the distrust of uh, companies will certainly impact the acceptance of these technologies. And we saw from a comparison with extant literature that our findings were confirmed in other studies. Also, um, from our uh, study, practically, uh, these findings can assist like policymakers, system developers, and manufacturers of these uh, devices, giving them a clearer perspective as how to handle the express concerns, uh, both privacy and security concerns of users. What was one of the main limitations of the study? The potential noise. Because if we're extracting from Brandwatch, we have a lot of tweets that we're actually using. So one of the main limitations associated with this was the potential noise that accompanied social media posts and the impact of pulling the data from only one source. Because in this study, we were only examine, uh, examining Twitter posts. And that, could have, and that can be seen as a limitation. So what then would be some other areas for future research? Um, one, we can... Uh, expand this study by doing a survey uh, study uh, where we can you know, further examine and explore the generalizability of these findings. We can seek to better understand the concerns from users on other platforms like Reddit or even Facebook um, or even LinkedIn, some of those tools where people are talking. We can ex expand to other platforms to, to do that uh, co uh, uh, corroboration. Of, of, of thoughts to see what's there. The penultimate idea, 
to investigate other factors that may relate to privacy and, and security concerns. This could be looking at the, the, the adoption of these technologies from the standpoint of, of age, uh, gender, and even culture. And the final uh, idea for future research is having probably an examination of the relationships that exist between express sentiments and each privacy and security concerns. Thank you in 22 minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. We want, to thank we want to thank Dr. Mitchell for his timely and informative presentation. At this time, we can only take one question. Is there a question that a member of the, con of the group of the... Yes, is there a question at this time? We are open for one question. Okay. Thank you very much. And we thank Dr. Mitchell again. At this time, we will now have Dr. Giles carrying out his presentation. Thank you. It's not, it's not moving. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the topic of my presentation is the effect of allium sativum, which is garlic, and hibiscus sabdara for Jamaican sorrel on cancer cells. As you know, cancer is a disease that touches almost everyone. For individuals who don't know much about it, if you live long enough, whether someone related to you or somebody you know, you will hear of some information about this dreaded disease. Over time, some of my colleagues Along with myself, we decided that by research, colored compounds do have phytochemicals that have high possibilities for the treatment of diseases. So we decided to take a look at some of the common things we know. Garlic is something that many households utilize for many medical challenges. And the sorrel utilized at Christmas time is a colored calyx plant. So we decided to take a look at it, and it's based upon this work that we have done, why sorrel becomes a product 
that is utilized all throughout the year over the world. In Malaysia and India, they have grown this plant, utilize it, but many information was not known until recently. So over the many years, uh, though cancer referred to a single condition, it actually consists of more than 100 different diseases, all characterized by uncontrolled growth and spread of abnormal cells. Normal cells, ladies and gentlemen, divide until they are programmed to stop or the body or organ reaches a specific size or stage and then ceases to divide or is programmed to die. That's how normal cells operate. But cancer cells, however, ignore signals to stop dividing, to specialize or to die and be shed according to Columbia University. The cancer remains one of the leading causes of death in the world. More specifically, it's the major cause of death in women between the ages of 35 and 74. And for males, the most prominent cancer is prostate cancer. And in children under the age of 15, the American Institute Cancer Research and also the World Research Fund, they have realized that many children coming down with cancers. Three of the most prominent, promising areas of research include the study of cancer on the molecular level, the role of genetics in the development of cancer and the effect of natural products on the prevention and curative treatment of cancer in all its form, according to Martinez and others. 1997, natural products such as garlic and sorrel have been used as therapeutic agents in treating medical problems. And as I mentioned before, it is alleged that both products may have anti-cancer properties according to law et al. What we did, we utilized three cell lines, one, ep 2 this was taken from a, the larynx of a 56-year-old cancer patient. And this cell is grown over the years and exists now and can be utilized. Also, the A549 cell is a lung cancer cell, came from a Caucasian male. And over the years, these cells have been grown and utilized. We utilize a non-cancerous cell line, which is taken from baby hamster kidney. Uh, normally, we culture these cells, and we utilize 10% uh, fetal bovine albumin. And uh, we utilize a non-essential uh, medium called minimum essential Eagle 4 medium. And uh, incubation was done in a carbon dioxide incubator over time and for 12 hours and 48 hours this was utilized. In the materials and methods, sorrel seed and calyx, they were utilized also. We utilized 10 gram of garlic and we processed these and we treated the cells that, was, that were grown over time and we examined the cells all three cell lines over 12 hours and 48 hours, and we check for cell viability. We further look at to see what happens to the cell, and we check for uh, DNA, and we look at the DNA profiles following treatment with these natural products. After uh, 18 to 24 hours of incubation. Uh, in terms of variation, uh, the cells following treatment, we have uh, the cells, there is fragmentation, and uh, the normal cells vary in shape. They all were chopped up into pieces 
based upon the treatment. And we notice that the longer the treatment, the more significant the effect. I will show you this in a little while. And following treatment with both garlic and sorrel extracts. The tripon blue test was utilized and it was uh, checked for viability of the cells. And this was done in 12 hours and in 48 hours. We're going to take a look at the morphological changes. We're going to take a look at it in a little while. And following the treatment with our various products. Uh, the, it was noticed that there's a BCL2 gene that favors the growth of cancer cells. And the fact that we see fragmentation and condensation and the breaking up of cells is an indication that the natural products have overridden the effect of the BCL2 gene, which uh, means that they have strong possibility for the treatment of cancers. Look at the viability. After 18, 48 hours, we notice that most significant viability uh, with, exists with the garlic and the calyx. The calyx is that little red part of the sorrel that we utilize in 48 hours, viability still exists, uh, and for the seed, decreased viability. Over 72 hours, we still have that. But take a look at these. Untreated cells showing neoplas neoplasia. That's the normal cells. 1A, 1B, 1C. For the BHK cells, uh, that's a normal cell in the middle. 1B, 1C, the growth of uh, lung cancer cells for the uh, 1A, that's the laryngeal cells. Take a look at it. Treatment of EP2 cells with calyx extract examined in 12 hours, that's 2A. And at 2B, you see treatment of EP2 cells with calyx extract and examined in 24 hours. You can see clear that the amount of cells remains sparse based upon the fact that, you know, the treatment has uh, dissolved those cells by utilizing the extract from the sorrel uh, calyx. If you take a look at that with the seed, similar results occur with the seed. Uh, which is an indication clear after 3A treatment in 12 hours and you see further treatment in 24 hours, you see those significant changes. Same thing uh, with garlic utilized. Uh, you can hardly see, but those are cells 3A. And further, garlic in 48 hours, you see a significant difference in those cells. All right, uh, treatment with, uh, these are, those I showed you before was with EP2 cells, which is laryngeal cancer cells. These are from lung cancer cells. In 12 hours, uh, 5A, give you a treatment, and in 48 hours, using the calyx, you can see the significant change that exists right, right there. There you go. Look at the normal cells now. See that not not uh, you see large amount of growth existing both with the normal cell line uh, following treatment with calyx. So the normal cells does not respond, but what you see is that the cancer cells are mark responses with the various cancer cells. All right, BHK, same thing with seed extract. You know, uh, quite a bit of cells you can see there, you know, growing. And with 
not significant effect on normal cells. So what you have is uh, products that are specific for the cancer cells and remain uh, what you'd say supportive for the non-cancerous cells and that is what you want. When, it, when individuals do have cancers and when treated uh, with the products, you want to know that you utilize a product that will remain what you call it, uh, preserve your normal cells in the run. So what you have seen here is uh, the normal cells being preserved while the cancerous cells are destroyed. And that is what you want. With chemotherapy, radiation therapy, your normal cells and your cancer cells are affected and destroyed. So this proved that utilizing these natural products have very good potential for the treatment of uh, cancers. What you see there, we do an electrophoretic pattern following treatment, and you can see there's some significant, uh, there's varied banding patterns, but we believe that the, the bands, certain key bands uh, in uh, number one, two, four lanes, five lanes, six lanes are significant bands, and these bands may hold what you say the answer to the what you say the spread of the cancer, because we believe that within these bands are genes. Uh, that if you isolate these genes, you can utilize these genes to target the cancerous situation. And you automatically will help a lot of individuals, you know, uh, who come down with certain cancers. What we're looking at is to utilize a wide range of natural products. And we're looking at colon cancers. We're looking at breast cancer, prostate cancer, and we're utilizing a wide variety of other natural products which we believe will make a big difference. In terms of prognosis and possibilities for the future, our belief is that if you should boost your system with these natural products, it will make a big difference in strengthening your immunity and you're able to, what you'd say, ward off even the possibilities. If you do take chemotherapy, boosting your system and strengthening your immunity, it will make a big difference in dealing with cancerous situation. <coughs> Those are your references from the World Cancer Research Fund and uh, various law and others as researchers and we have joined a wide variety of other researchers in utilizing natural products that we believe will make a good potential difference in the future when it comes to cancers. This is my presentation. Uh, another time we'll take a look at you know some of the uh, key uh, natural products, uh, key elements within the natural products. We mentioned phytochemicals, uh, which are certain chemical substances. We're looking at isolating these substances and utilizing them directly in the treatment of cancer. These are my presentation, ladies and gentlemen. Is there any question you'd like to ask? Thank you very much. I want to thank Dr. Giles for his wonderful presentation. It was very informative. So we are available for one question. Any questions? Okay, thank you again, Dr. Giles. 
At this time, we will have a presentation from Mr. Yes, at this time, we'll have a presentation from Mr. Tuma. Karan Tuma. It will be an electronic presentation. So I'm going to ask you to give all your attention to the screen as this presentation is provided. All right. Thank you very much. Good day, everyone. In this presentation, we'll be looking at mobile security, and we'll be exploring the attitudes and perceptions of users as it relates to their device and mobile security. Some of the key terms that we are going to be examining in this presentation are mobile device, security risk, vulnerability, threat, and exploitation. According to the National Institute of Standards and Technology, a mobile device is a portable computing device such as a smartphone, tablet, or e-reader. The Oxford Dictionary defines security risk as a person or a situation which poses a possible threat to the security of something. And according to techtarget.com, vulnerability is a flaw in a code or design that creates a potential point of security compromise for a computing device or network. Vulnerabilities create possible attack vectors through which an intruder could run code or access a, a target system. And the term threat, according to the SANS uh, org, is a potential for violation of security, which exists when there is a circumstance, capability, action, or event that could breed security and cause harm. And Cisco defines an exploit as a program, piece of code, that is designed to find or take advantage of a security flaw or vulnerability in an application or computer system, typically for malicious purposes, such as installing malware. An exploit is not the malware itself, but rather it is a method used by cyber criminals to carry out an attack. In this table, we can see various different types of attacks, such as malware, network attacks, phishing, scamming, spoofing, and theft. Essentially, malware is something we'll be very familiar with, and this is simply just malicious code. The term malware is coined uh, based on two terms, malicious and software. Essentially, uh, this can be any kind of software that you know can damage or it can delete files, damage your computer system, delete files, etc. There are many variations and categories of malware that we're not going to get into because of the time constraint for this presentation. Network attacks may include various types of attacks which, for example, uh, using free Wi-Fi hotspots, criminals could gain uh, a victim's um, information very easily because many persons enjoy you know just getting access to a, a free Wi-Fi wherever they, they go especially when you're traveling uh, we also have phishing and scamming and this is something that we we see very prevalent now in Jamaica and that is a cause for concern where you can be sent a text or email message etc uh, ask you to disclose and of course it could seem to be from a legitimate source, asking you to disclose certain personal and also, um, you know, maybe password and other credentials that could give attackers the chance to get access into your bank accounts, online, uh, you know, credit card accounts, etc., to be able to get access to uh, different things that may be meaningful and financially gaining for them. We also have spoofing attacks, and we have seen some of these as well, where you know it could be an email that looks like it's coming from a legitimate source, 
uh, where attackers use even websites to that look very very legitimate like you know maybe Amazon or maybe your online banking website once again with the whole idea of capturing credentials and being able to you know withdraw maybe the money from your bank accounts or if it's online shopping maybe use up your credit card or even your debit card right so these are some of the ways and of course if you lose your device this is also something that we have seen as well where criminals can get access to your data once it's 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 uh, in their possession so you have to be very careful and vigilant with uh, your devices let's look at some statistics as we can see here this is looking at the world population and mobile phone users and we can see that in terms of mobile phone subscription this is like way surpassing the world population I mean some persons have two or three devices and this is uh, expected to continue the trend to grow exponentially in terms of the amount of devices that we have and you know with all of that it means that criminals have more access to to your data or opportunity to get access to your data and information on these devices all right here's another chart that is looking at cybercrime and you know the projections and we can see the estimated cost worldwide and it's in the billions it's at well trillions in this case it's, it's a lot of money right well trillions in US dollars I don't know how that converts right now off the top of my head in terms of Jamaican dollars but it's it's quite a lot all right uh, okay. also there is another study from Microsoft that looks at the the various um, industries that we can see affected by malware and uh, it's we can see education is way out there so the education system or the education industry needs to kind of realize that you know you're not you're not um, we are we're not um, safe right because we are being targeted by criminals constantly all right so you can see that is important and that is the reason why we also have this study that we're talking about here today and as we zoom into various types of attacks right that uh, criminals use we can see here that your mobile devices uh, are being targeted because when we look at the top three even top four um, on this chart we're seeing where 41 percent is using viruses and targeting mobile devices um, SMS scam and phishing right 35 and 30 percent so we can see that this is very very important for us as users of mobile devices to be very very vigilant right we can't let our guards down because attackers are really focusing and zooming in on um, our mobile uh, devices and computing devices even here at home we can see that attacks are being um, you know proliferated because we have for example the office of the Prime Minister and the J Jamaica I being involved in several attacks and this was uh, not very long ago this was uh, recently last year this was published in the Observer right even the Jamaica Information Service has something to say about that just uh, reporting on the cost of cybercrime that it could reach in the trillions of dollars Jamaican this this time right as um, Dr. Horace Chang the Minister of uh, Security would have been you know mentioning some things as it relates to the proliferation of the dark web activities and this is something that you know he is definitely cognizant of and uh, trying to see how they can put things in place to mitigate against these types of attacks also we have the Jamaica cyber cyber incident response team that is appealing to all individuals to be more responsible and to report cyber crime and if I'd asked for a show of hands in this particular venue in in this uh, symposium I'm sure many of you would raise your hand to say yes you know of someone 
right? Whether it be a family member, a relative, a community member, or just a colleague who has been a victim of cybercrime. So it's not very far from where you are. And you know, there's a saying that cyber, a cyber threat or a cyber incident or a cyber crime anywhere is a threat to you know, just um, your overall safety wherever you are. You may think you're safe, but it's just a matter of time before you may also become a victim if you don't put things in place to mitigate against these types of um, threats. All right, so let's look at the context and background of this study. So mobile devices have increased in their features, functionality, and use cases over the years. Now, this has provided mobile users with great convenience and flexibility to use their devices on the go. But it's this ability to use mobile devices for such you know, range of different kind of essential and critical services that such as online banking, shopping, communication, that presents a security challenge for mobile users and also organizations. According to one report by Bitdefender, thousands of Android devices worldwide actually contain hidden malware that creates security vulnerabilities for many Android users around the world. A report published by Forbes magazine stated also that mobile device attacks has increased by 50% in 2022, with scams and credential theft being the top exploits that are utilized. Now, while companies realize the security risks posed by employees using their own mobile devices at work, the adoption of bring your own devices or BOID Right, especially during the COVID pandemic, resulted in increased cybersecurity incidents. And so with the enactment of even legislation such as the Jamaica D Data Protection Act of 2020, there is now a greater awareness about data protection and data privacy, and by extension, security. Most or mobile devices contain a lot of personal and sensitive um, personal data that can be exposed and exploited if it gets into the hands of malicious persons. This can occur if the device is lost, stolen, or if a security vulnerability is exploited. And so it is with this background that we can look at the aim of this study or the different objectives that we had for this study. Well, we wanted to identify the number of mobile uh, users that have adopted password best practices. Also, we wanted to evaluate the prevalence of security incidents among mobile users. We wanted to examine the perceptions and uh, habits of mobile users as it relates to mobile security. And we also wanted to determine the risk profile of mobile users based on their security practices. So let us look at the process. Convenience sampling was the preferred method in this case, and we utilize online um, survey instrument, and we targeted approximately 500 students. Uh, this was considered sufficient, at least for the investigation that we're doing, which would allow for uh, our response rate error and eliminate biases in the responses. Now, we had customized our instrument to meet the specific needs and purpose of this study. And of course, Google Forms was the preferred method that was used, or tool, and that was downloaded in a uh, Microsoft S Excel spreadsheet and then exported to IBM SPSS for data analysis. We took a quantitative approach um, in this study and descriptive statistics for demographic data such as frequency standard deviation were determined. Uh, we also used Cronbach Alpha to evaluate the reliability of the rating questions. Statistics of central tendencies such as mean mode were also used to evaluate the data collected. Key findings. Key finding number one, only 
of uh, passwords actually contained 10 characters or more uh, with a combination of text and numbers being utilized. We had only about 46.4 46 respondents saying that they changed their passwords at some point. We realized that even you know, looking at persons who never change your password, we had approximately 50.6% of respondents saying that they never, ever changed their password, which poses, obviously, a security risk if those passwords were exposed on the dark web. And so, you know, these are some of the practices that we realized would have put persons at risk. Key finding number two, we looked at 35.1% of mobile devices being lost or stolen. And once again, this means that once this gets into the hands of malicious persons, persons who will probably take advantage of that in terms of the data that they can find and whatever else they can do with the information on your device, that poses also a security risk. We also found out that 42.9% of respondents said that their devices would have been infected with malware at some point. Key finding number three, 44.1% of persons in looking at their perceptions about uh, security said that they saw no danger in free app downloads. And we saw another 47.6% of persons said that they believe that pirated websites are actually safe. While we had a percentage of 699 uh, who said that, well, free and open Wi-Fi does not pose any security risk. And once again, we can see where this is a big problem in terms of that mindset that there is nothing wrong with these practices this would definitely uh, put those persons at greater risk for malware, infection, etc. Key finding number four, we saw where the majority of persons would have been at moderate risk in terms of their habits and their practices as it relates to mobile security. So in conclusion, practices such as downloading free apps, videos, music, and other files from untrusted sources, connecting to free Wi-Fi hotspots or unsecured networks, as well as poor password practices, do pose a great risk to mobile users. The findings indicate that many persons are either unaware or unwilling to make mobile security an important practice in their daily lives. Recommendations. Some of the recommendations that we have include the use of strong passwords, right? So it, it has to be a combination of letters, numbers, symbols, and the password length has to be at least 10 characters. Also, you want to enable multi-factor authentication, such as SMS verification, biometrics, etc. You also want to strengthen your security settings on your, your network. You want to ensure also that you browse your, the web and the websites that you're using safely, ensuring that these sites are secure sites and legitimate official sites before you utilize them. And stay away from pirated materials as much as possible because these do pose great security risks to your devices. In addition to that, you want to ensure that you have the anti-malware and or internet security software installed. You want to ensure that you examine the links that you are given in your, uh, on your, in your WhatsApp and different kind of social media before you just click on a link that is forwarded to you. It's very, very important for you to think before you click on that link. And keep your software and operating system up to date and show you have a backup of your files at you know, every given point, and not just local backups, but you also have backups in the cloud that just in case, worst case scenario, you'll still have access to your files because we realize that there are many uh, ransomware, for example, attack where 
your data is encrypted, you don't have access to it, and you, you, know, you may be asked to pay a ransom for that. And educate yourself and those around you. you know, keep up with, um, there are many different news forms online that you can uh, get information regarding you know, cybersecurity threats and different things that are happening that you need to be aware of. And uh, even for the banks as well, I know this is something that NCB, for example, is doing. They, from time to time, they will send you emails and messages about how to stay safe. So, you know, look at those, read them, and make sure you practice those things to keep safe. All right. Thank you so very much for listening. Yes, I want to thank uh, Mr. Tuma for his wonderful presentation. All right, let's give him a round of applause. Unfortunately, we won't be able to take any question on this or questions on this presentation because of the time constraints. At this time, we are going to welcome Ms. Janisha Bryan Thomas to do her presentation. Let us listen as she informs us about the topic, okay? Good afternoon, everyone. I know it is not the nicest time to be standing to share with you anything, and so I'm going to ask, you've been sitting for a while, just stand up. Yes, we are, we are Yes, stand and stretch away. Yes, you can do it. Yes, wonderful. You see, when we come here, we want the information to at least be able to resonate with you. So please sit now, yes? Right, there we go. So for those persons who are about to sleep, I think the blood is running through the brain again as we look into something that is quite important to all of us. Uh, for the next few moments, I'll be sharing with you some information as it pertains to antimicrobial resistant patterns of commonly isolated microbes in, Jam in a Jamaican hospital. And this is a five-year analysis. Now, the team of researchers that completed this research includes Professor Paul Giles, Assistant Professor Casey Reed, Professor Patience Alonge, and Mrs. Frederica Coombs. Now, when we speak of antimicrobial resistance, um, what does it mean? What is it all about? Well, the first thing we can say is that it is a global challenge. Um, we've heard, you know, many persons speaking about diabetes, um, yes, it is a challenge. We've heard persons speaking about, you know, other cardiovascular illnesses, but not many people speak about these microbes that we don't necessarily see. But these microbes are the cause of a lot of challenges, not just here in Jamaica, but globally. Now, because of this challenge, we sought to determine the general trends of antimicrobial resistance. And in order to get this done, a retrospective analysis um, was completed from January 2019, going right down to December 2023. The case files that were analyzed revealed that throughout the period, 3,800 and 85 pathogens were isolated from, um, from patients during the test period. Of that, 57 micro, different microbial um, categories um, were, were found. As we look at different uh, frequencies of the 3,885 samples, 2,811 came from urine, and of the overall samples that came in, 1,113 um, samples reveal the presence of Escherichia coli. Um, this, the, 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 the analysis also showed that there is indeed an increased uh, resistant pattern seen for, for ampicillin and Enterobacter, Enterobacter um, gergovia showed the highest overall resistant patterns 
of the general antimicrobial cocktails that were used. Now that's just the abstract, putting a lot of things in probably a few seconds. Now let us just go into some literature that I believe will be able to augment the information that will be shared with you this afternoon. Now antimicrobial resistance says by Murray et al. 2022 remains a significant threat to global health sector owing to the inequality of new efficient antibiotics and of course the rate of, of uh, microbial resistance. Now the problem of antimicrobial resistance is even more acute um, in our own borders as it pertains to developing country. And this, we believe, is due to the, the general access to new and efficient antimicrobial um, therapies. And because of this, there is an overuse of outdated um, antibiotics, which definitely is a driving force in AMR. Now, AMR here, we're talking about antimicrobial resistance. And as we move on, you'll hear me speak about AMR, and you know exactly what it means. So AMR stands for what? There we go. If I had a ripe banana, not a sweetie, based on the presentations this morning, you would have gotten a one. So multidrug resistance um, has been most frequently seen in a particular group. And the group works, well, there's an acronym that was created um, some time ago. And um, here we found it from Pan et al. 2022, and that is the escape group. Now, the escape group speaks to a unique class of opportunistic pathogens spanning from microbes um, such as Enterococcus faecium, Staphylococcus aureus, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Acinectobacter, um, Bomani, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and general Enterobacter species. Now these pathogens, and I'm just pulling out two, Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Staphylococcus aureus, these microbes are often implicated in nosocomal infections. What are we talking about here? Um, persons who would have had a, an extended stay in the hospitals are often found to come down with infections from Staph aureus and Pseudomonas. Now, we are, we are I'm giving you a little piece of the pie as we move on. The fact that these microbes are oftentimes implicated, whether um, through direct or indirect sources, there is indeed a need for us to monitor the resistance among microbes. Now, WHO um, you know, gives their own general input as it pertains to this surveillance. And what they're saying is that continuous surveillance is very much needed as a bid to stem continuous or the continued incidence of antimicrobial resistance. Um, there, though, with all of this and with WHO saying quite a bit, there is indeed a shortage of general data on the trends of antimicrobial resistance among, um, among microbes that are isolated here in Jamaica within our own borders. Now, despite the urgency or the urgent need as given by, by um, WHO, we definitely um, have been seeing a scant as, uh, only, well, only scanned studies are actually published about information coming from Jamaica. What we have seen, we've seen papers looking at methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. We've seen papers looking at Escherichia coli in terms of the general resistance in chickens. And we've seen papers looking at general knowledge and attitudes of physicians and other health workers as it pertains to methicillin, as it pertains to resistant trends. However, what we have not seen is a study looking at least having a, a five-year study on all of the isolated microbes and looking at the general patterns and trends. Now, given the fact that WHO is recommending continuous surveillance, and we're definitely into that, um, and the fact that there is a general paucity of that type of information. We, um, research team and myself, we aimed to survey the prevalence of antimicrobial resistant trends in Jamaica um, to assist 
with the um, documentation. And so this research in itself is more so a snapshot of the latest trends in antimicrobial resistance. And we hope that it will you know, lay the foundation for future molecular and epidemiological studies as it pertains to explaining the mechanisms that are at play with the resistant microbes. Now, a study of this nature, looking at all the isolated microbes over a five-year period, has not um, been previously reported. As such, a study of this magnitude was needed to determine the possible trends of antimicrobial resistance with the aim to aid in the prevention of mortality and morbidity. Now, the current, current study stands to fill just a part of the gaps because there is so much that we can do. And even with this presentation, it is really simply going to be a summary of the work that we have. As, so, as such, the, the uh, present study fills just a small gap as it pertains to the knowledge of um, AMR resistant patterns in microbes that would have been isolated here in Jamaica. From, from our, our study or retrospective analysis, we looked at a large cross section of samples such as the urine, the eyes, wound swabs, vaginal swabs, aspirate, semen, samples, catheter, stool, um, also samples, throat swabs, sputum, and abscesses. And we were not keen in picking a particular group of microbes because we really wanted to see what was happening out there. As such, we included the wide spectrum of microbes that you know, falls under different categories or GPCs or GNBs or, or, or fungal samples, GP, GPBs, GNCs, and GNDCs. Now, just to give you a, a little schematic representation of what the methodology um, looks like, well, we spent quite a bit of time acquiring approval from the necessary institutions um, for the use of the data, and quite a bit of time sorting and compiling the data. The analysis of the data took some time as well. The interpretation, and here is part one of the several parts of the presentation of the findings. Now, for those persons who are not satisfied with what I just said, perhaps this one will give you a little bit more detail as it pertains to what it is that we did. So with the antibiograms that were obtained, as I said before in the abstract, 3,885 case files were analyzed. <clears throat> but we had, to well, we had to exclude a few things because um, we did not have uh, there were missing IDs and missing antibiotic res results, and so we had to exclude a few things which brought us down to 3,347 samples. As it then we you know, in in input that in the, um, the Excel, Excel files, then from that we brought that into our SPSS. We went on again after we did that initial analysis and had a second a second uh, level of exclusions for those microbes that had frequency less than 3%. Those were excluded, which accounted for 894 um, samples. And then we clearly completed the study with a 2,991 um, case files where we did our sample-wise, microbe-wise distribution of pathogens. Now, a big summary here in terms of Escherichia coli, um, 1,113 of these, um, this particular microbe was seen. Enterobacter species, 605. Enterobacter um, gergovia, 2, 267. Proteus mirabilis, 186. Corgulase negative staph, 252. Or group D streptococcus, 207 Pseudomonas aeruginosa accounted for 165 of the total, and Staphylococcus aureus 121. Now, as we go down to our general results, you're seeing a nice pie, pretty pie. Um, the large green section represents our Escherichia coli. Now, in 2019, 164 
um, isolates of Escherichia coli was seen 2020, 223, 2021, 237, 200, and, um, 218 for two, 2022, and 271 for 2023. Why am I mentioning this? We're seeing that E. coli definitely has been isolated a whole lot, which accounted for 29.96% of the total microbes that were isolated overall. At the bottom, um, and I'm just mentioning this because I know you, you're not able to necessarily see it, in terms of um, year-wise analysis of microbes, um, 2023, accounted for 913 of the 3,885 microbes. And the year with the lowest amount came from 2022 with 732 samples being isolated. Now a comparison of the samples, the overall samples that um, were seen and you're seeing to the side, you know, a little you know, schematic of whatever it was, and I'd mentioned that in the beginning. However, the big thing to look at is that, lar that arrow, which represents the urine samples um, accounting for quite a bit, and followed by the wound swab. So we had a lot of urine samples um, that came in for processing and followed by the wound swabs. Um, right. Now here, as we look at the pathogen with the relative frequency greater than 3%, we're seeing that um, Staphylococcus aureus accounted for 3.2% of the overall amount. Um, e. coli accounted for 29.8%. Enterobacter species, 16.2%. Enterobacter um, G, we'll call it G, 7.2%, Pseudomonas, 4.4%, and so on. Here, what we did when we looked at the frequency, we found that these microbes were those that stood out with quite a bit of frequencies, hence they were included for that particular pie. Now we're moving down quite nicely to the frequency of resistance to antibiotics. Now I'd like for you to look closely on the different colors. So the red section, or the red, yes, the red represents our sensitive, um, sensitive, the sensitivity of the, the, the antibiotic, meaning this particular antibiotic was able to kill the microbe and this is what we want. But we are actually paying closer attention on the blue because the blue represents the resistance that we are seeing. And if you look um, quite closely, you'll see ampicillin. The blue is even larger than the red, which, which definitely tells us that we are seeing more resistance to ampicillin than we are seeing susceptibility to ampicillin. Moving over to, as we go up the chart, um, ceftazidime is showing a similar trend. Um, ceftriaxone is showing a similar trend. We are seeing similar trends as well for um, piperacillin, and also for tetracycline. And some of these are broad spectrum antibiotics where um, doctors may simply, a patient comes in with a particular illness and a doctor may simply say, you know, based on your signs and symptoms, this antibiotic should be able to assist. So with the wanton use of these antibiotics, it really does add to the incidence of resistance. Now what is being projected here is a, a relationship map showing the relationship, the microbial relationship of the use of um, ampicillin among samples, and of course we're looking at the relationship between ampicillin, samples, and the microbe. Now the thicker the line, the greater the relationship, and the larger the outer circle in terms of the general green represents the samples that had repeated incidence or frequency. So we are seeing here, um, based on the information that, would have, that was previously mentioned, that penic not penicillin, that ampicillin is one of the most frequently used antibiotics. Hence, we can also I, I, um, understand to some extent why then we're finding that type of resistant pattern. We're seeing here the 
another relationship, but it shows us a part of our sunburst pie, the frequency of ampicillin as it, as it relates to the other antibiotics that had um, frequency in terms of resistant patterns greater than 100 samples. Well, the resistant trends um, for this one was accounted based on the frequency of resistance. So if we had more than 100 or more resistance, then it would be considered for our, um, our, our study to be a part of the general resistance trends. And here we're finding ampicillin augmenting, ciprofloxacin, um, cefotriaxime, Bactrim or floxacin, um, piperacillin, and gentamicin. Now we're moving down to our microbe-wise analysis. Now we started out initially by mentioning the frequency of the microbes in the overall study. And here we are looking at um, the resistance within, within the general microbes. Um, significant resistant patterns are seen with ampicillin. Um, with over 619 samples showing resistance, accounting for 55.6% um, for E. coli. And you're seeing the, the general trend where we're seeing augmenting, ciprofloxacin, and so on. Um, Enterobacter species accounted for 77.6% of the general resistance. And again, we're looking at resistance to ampicillin. Then we go over to Enterobacter G, now this one is big, so I'm going to pause a little, because 267 um, isolates, um, were, isolates were made, and of that 267, 257 of all of the, the microbes were resistant to ampicillin. And this study is actually, well, would have taken place right on our borders. Um, Proteus mirabilis accounted for 50, um, we had 55.4% of the Proteus mirabilis um, refusing to be killed by nitrofurantoin, which is another antibiotic that is actually showing some amount of resistance. Now, our coagulase negative staff also had some amount of resistance. Now, we know um, for, 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 some, for some studies, they say that you know, the coagulase negative staff is a part of the normal flora. But what comes out really big is that if it's a part of the normal flora, we know normal flora, those are the resident microbes on the body. But if they proliferate, they can cause um, quite a bit of infection. We are seeing resistance to antibiotics from this particular microbe as well. Or group D strep also showed some amount. I'm moving a little bit fast because I'm seeing that the time is going down. Somebody ate off some of my time, so I will have to run through quickly. Um, Pseudomonas originosa had the another, well, we saw 88% resistance to ampicillin, 81% augmenting, 81% um, also for ceftrioxone, 81% for Bactrim and 42% for nitrofurantoin. We just included nitrofurantoin here because nitrofurantoin came in quite handy with another one. For staph, 61% resistant to ampicillin. Um, I won't have the time necessarily to go through this particular important table, but I'm sure when the paper is officially published, you will be able to see that if you check with Professor Giles. Um, now, other persons um, would have done some amount of studies. Here we're seeing um, where antimicrobial susceptibility trends among E. coli and salmonella was done, you know, on, on samples from 1995 to 2000. But for this one, they actually looked at the different types of E. coli um, and the different toxins, and again, even from back then, they were seeing, and this I believe was done in, in Egypt, they were actually seeing resistant trends as well to ampicillin. Now, moving forward, another um, research was done which looked at incidence and molecular characterization of multidrug resistance in gram-negative bacteria. This was done in Nigeria. But this time, what, what was, um, was done, they looked at wastewater coming from a, phar um, a pharmaceutical company. And again, we are seeing resistant trends. Now, what are the recommendations? 
No, the, the reality is, to the best of our knowledge, based on our literature review and search, um, this study is the first of its kind in Jamaica providing AMR trends in major pathogens from a cross-sectional um, cross section of samples. I won't necessarily reiterate all of this, but we are seeing resistance right across the board, and the microbes that we're seeing here are not necessarily following the same patterns in terms of the escape patterns, um, the escape microbes, because I would have mentioned initially in the overview what are the escape microbes, but outside of those escape microbes, we're finding Escherichia coli, we're finding Proteus mirabilis, we're finding Corgulase negative staph, and we're finding group, negative strep um, group D streptococcus, which is outside of the escape pathogens. So while we're sitting here quite nice and dandy thinking all is well because you don't have that diabetes, I can tell you, AMR is on your tail, if not already sitting somewhere else on your body. Final point. From the standpoint of these findings, it is our recommendation that quarterly assessment of antibiograms from all uh, microbial facilities be carried out in Jamaica. Now, this um, can be used as a surveillance tool to aid in the full determination of new antimicrobial strains and so on. Mr. Foster is standing right here, and just as how he just bounced upon me, antimicrobial resistance is bouncing upon you without you knowing. Um, so, acknowledgement, I'm not saying you are that. I um, would simply like to thank God for giving the team the ability to complete or, you know, putting in this, the, the, the necessary steps to get this research done. My students that are here for full support, thank you. Family and our general research team, Professor Giles, main research advisor, um, assistant professor, Dr. Casey Reed, and Professor um, Patience Alonge, along with Mrs. Frederica Coombs. Thank you so much. If there is need for questions, I'm sure it will be taken perhaps at another time. We want to thank Ms. Janisha Bryan Thomas for her wonderful presentation. It was very informative. And at, so, at this time, we're gonna, I'm going to ask those who are here just to support us for a, a short while. Don't leave us yet. We need your support. There are two more presentations which will take up a little while, so just bear with us and, and give us the support. So now at this time, we're going to ask Dr. Mucci to come and do our presentation, which is very informative. So please bear with us and give us the support. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I know it is not very easy to do the presentation towards the end, but I just request a little bit of your energy to listen to this, which is next to the last. I'm here to present on the effect of breakfast consumption on behavior and academic performance in a private university in Mandeville. But allow me first to acknowledge my very talented undergraduate student, Chanel Nelson and Nika Johnson, who conducted this research under my supervision during um, the research methods class in the Department of Nutrition and Dietetics. Allow me also to acknowledge my two colleagues, Dr. James Fala and Ms. Jones, who assisted in evaluating the student and shaping several aspects of this research. If I was to ask, how many here took breakfast today? How many took breakfast? It is not even half. Did you know breakfast was was such an important meal of the day. There is a growing concern regarding the effect of breakfast 
consumption on academics and behavior in schools among university students, not only in Jamaica, but across the world. And according to Ratin and Zimbat, breakfast is the first meal that an individual should consume at the beginning of the day, two to three hours after waking. And you know someone has taken fast the whole night and so breakfast contributes to 20 to 30 percent of the total energy needs. Now what happens during fasting such as overnight when people are sleeping the blood sugar levels goes down and so the liver breaks down glycogen and releases it as glucose into the bloodstream to maintain the stable blood sugar levels. And so as a result, glycogen stores are low in the morning after going up to 12 hours without eating. Hence, your body begins to break down fatty acids to provide energy if your glycogen stores are completely depleted. And yet, this is very crucial for your brain which nearly exclusively uses glucose as fuel. Bre uh, breakfast increases your energy levels and replenishes your glycogen stores to, so that your metabolism is maintained throughout the day. Studies have indicated that nutrients in breakfast not only serve as energy sources, but also help people stay alert, focused, and intelligent. He continues, uh, Dave, David continues to say that breakfast consumption is linked to better subject knowledge, regular attendance, and improved problem solving skills. Recent studies have demonstrated that breakfast enhances intellectual capacity, concentration, attention, and academic performance. A research done by Adolphus mentioned that consuming breakfast helps students to learn better as it relates to cognition, conduct, academic success. Furthermore, maintaining focus and attention in classes results to long-term academic achievement and more productive learning environment. A study that was conducted by Taha found out that breakfast consumption was statistically significant with academic performance. The same study, uh, another study by Philip also confirmed that um, the students who had consumed breakfast were, had the ability to perform well in tests. Also, those who skip breakfast, they do bad in academic performance. They also lack energy. They normally have mood swing, memory, uh, retention issues, and even mood swift. I don't know the faculty members that are here, whether they have noticed that many times in the morning, students are not alert. This could be the reason. And so, the purpose of this study was to investigate the impact of breakfast consumption on the classroom behavior and performance of university students in a private institution in Mandeville. Specifically, the study investigated the frequencies of breakfast consumption. It assessed the knowledge and attitude towards breakfast, and it examined whether the quantity and quality of breakfast consumption had any effect on their academic behavior and performance. The variables of the study, independent variables were frequencies of breakfast consumption, knowledge and attitude of breakfast consumption, quantity and quality of breakfast consumption, while the dependent variables were classroom behavior and academic performance. The methodology that was utilized by this study was mixed method using both quantitative and qualitative. 
Quantitative data collection was done using online questionnaire, while qualitative used interview and observation. This study was done among 317 students using convenient sampling procedure. The data were later analyzed using SPSS version 29. Now, let me quickly take you through the results and discussion. Now, the question about frequencies of breakfast consumption indicated that only 39, a majority of the students actually took breakfast only once to two times per week. That was 39%. So, this means that the nutrients needs are not met very early in the morning. And this has implication when it comes to activeness, memory, and general performance during those early hours of the day. Now, the question about quantity of breakfast, my student showed some samples to, to indicate the nutrients dense breakfast and so when the respondents were asked whether they took heavy breakfast very heavy breakfast heavy moderate light or very light majority of the respondents indicated that they took the, their consumption was moderate the same with knowledge when they were asked whether they had um, knowledge about the importance of breakfast consumption, still majority showed that they had moderate knowledge of breakfast consumption. This moderate consumption of breakfast means that they don't have, they don't take heavy breakfast, yet studies done by Conford and Copper found out that students who ate health breakfast improved cognitive functions. This is because whenever a nutrient-dense meal is consumed, the mind is more alert, there is a, a lot more energy, and a stronger recall of resources that have been studied. Now, the question about nutrients dense when they were asked about the quantity, they remember they were moderate. And so this is supported by O'Neill's study, who also recommend breakfast consumption that is considered essential to replenish nutrient storage after a period of fasting while sleeping should be nutrient dense with protein rich. And those people who don't take meat, they can also substitute with vegetarian protein, leg like legumes, nuts, dairy products. They should also take carbohydrate-rich food, cereals, grains, and also fruits and vegetables. So with this kind of breakfast, the students will be alert, but they should reduce their saturated fatty acids, also the consumption of sodium. Knowledge, of course, was, was also found to be moderate. Now, when it came to the question about why they don't prepare breakfast, majority of the students said they, 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 they would be late in case they prepared breakfast. When they were asked about their performance, majority of the students acknowledged that whenever they take breakfast, their grades increased significantly. So, um, even the final exams, whenever they have consumed breakfast, their grades are better. That is what the study showed. Now, when we did the Pearson correlation significant, there was a significant correlation between breakfast consumption and alertness and also class participation. So it means those who consume breakfast are more attentive and participate positively in classroom than those who do not consume breakfast. 
there was also a significant correlation between quantity of breakfast and class participation. So those who take nutrient-dense breakfast, it correlates with participation. And so actually this is very, very um, common to our students and it, uh, we will even see when we did the qualitative, the responses that the student gave. So the student admitted that when they ate breakfast, the classroom behavior improved. This was supported by a study by Gosh, who found out that eating breakfast helps students help people attention, focus, intellectual aptitude, and also it leads to academic success. The same studies demonstrated if breakfast is not consumed, academic performance may decline. Now, the results from qualitative data indicated that most of the students, when we did interview, most of the students said the reason they don't consume breakfast is because of lack of time to prepare. Most of them gave excuses like they have, because of the increased academic work, it gives them stress, they are not able to sleep enough, and so they don't have time. Other students said they don't feel hungry in the morning. Other students said they lack money to purchase breakfast. Others said the breakfast is not accessible. Now, this result, the qualitative results, are supported by a study done by Garrido, which indicated that lower socioeconomic status of students affect their ability to afford a, or prepare breakfast regularly. And likewise, money, money management can also be a factor for a hindrance why students are not purchasing breakfast. So in conclusion, the majority of the students are not taking breakfast, which may negatively impact their memory, activeness, performance, and ability to meet the required nutrient value for rigorous academic work. Should this situation persist, most students may become malnourished or perform poorly due to poor memory capacity resulting from inactivity in class and poor concentration from skipping breakfast. The economic factors, accessibility, lack of time were also associated with breakfast consumption. And so what do we do now? The recommendations. The university policies should emphasize the importance of developing and implementing strategies that focus on promoting healthy eating among university students and provide nutrition education guidelines for a comprehensive health program with the aim of increasing knowledge of the importance of breakfast consumption and its effect on academic performance and general health. Schools should look for strategies that would encourage breakfast consumption among students. It is also suggested that measures such as readjustment of school timetable, perhaps maybe reducing cost of food from the university cafeteria, making breakfast accessible in all campuses, and especially here at NCU, I would recommend the accessibility of breakfast to be done up the hill among students, especially nursing students, nutrition, dietetic students, dental students, they, they find cafeteria to be very far. And so if that adjustment can be done because of this uh, accessibility. And so let us all start consuming breakfast. These are my references. I don't know whether there is a quick question. This is the end. Let us all embrace taking breakfast.
We want to thank Dr. Mucci for her timely and her informative presentation. At this time, we are down to the last presentation for the day. We ask that as Mr. Rose and Dr. Harris comes to do the, as they come to do the last presentation, I ask that to give them your, your untimely. Yes, I ask that to give them your attention and let us do our best to support the presentation for the day. demonstration uh, little activity first And gentlemen, I ask for your patience as we sort out some minor challenges. Just bear with us. Okay, in the meantime, <clears throat> that technology comes back to its senses. We laugh. <laughs> um, this time of the day, <clears throat> come here, come here. What do I press to move this light? Working, I'm not seeing it. What do you mean it's working? What I'm okay, all right. No, it's working. Thank you. All right. Now, um, we have been sitting here all day, and we're going to. I'm going to take a leaf out of uh, um, Miss Bryan's uh, book uh, for one thing, and um, I I'm going to do a little. Uh, ask you some members of the audience to participate in a little uh, experiment, a mini experiment. And you have to just trust me, right? Uh, that uh, you're going to be safe. But I'm going to ask the 10 
males and 10 females. I think you have been uh, approached before. If you could just come forward and stand on this platform beside me. I won't keep you here for more than about 10 minutes at the most. I want you to crack that bottle of water open. I just got it from the cafeteria. And have a sip of that water. And rinse and rinse, rinse, and then swallow that water, right? Okay? It's non-alcoholic. <laughs> okay. And, um... Yes, Mr. Rose. Kindly bring that back. Okay. I bought this loaf of bread, but I had to check it first. So I checked the three slices, and it suited the experiment. Okay? So what I'd like you to do I'd like each person <clears throat> to take a slice of the spread and take a bite out of it and think about it. <laughs> think, think about the sweetness and the saltiness. First think about the saltiness and then you think about the sweetness. And on a scale of 1 to 10, rate the sweetness. 10 being sugar and 10 being salt, granular salt, okay? And I'd like you to rate it 1 to 10. And I'd like a scribe, when you have gotten your result in your mind, then, thank you, Mr. Rose, then I'd like uh, a scribe, could I have a scribe volunteer to, uh, to write down what the respondents are going to tell you. Starting off with that end there, Mr. 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 Latte. Starting off with Mr. Latte and ending with Miss. Miss Rowe. Okay. All right. Please go right on ahead. Do we have a scribe in the audience, please? Kindly? If you want a pen, you could have one. And paper Do we have a volunteer, please? what you're thinking about first. Okay. Okay. Let's have your verdict. Mr. Latte, salt. What's your verdict? Seven? He said seven. Uh, Lorenzo, seven. I don't like two sevens coming consecutively, you know. I don't, I don't like it at all. I, I don't know if he's your friend or what. I don't know. Him. I'm just joking. Mr. Seven as well. Seven? Four. We have a four. 
six, five, three, seven and a half, eight, seven. Okay. Please uh, rinse with water now. Rinse thoroughly. Now you're going to go for sugar. You're starting already, sir? Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, Mr. Latter, we're ready for you. Sugar. He said five. Five for sugar. Four for sugar. Five. Five. Three. Three. Five. One. Three. Three. Oh, rinse again. We need these crackers. These crackers now. Yeah. This is the last one. Crackers. Rinse, please. Make sure you rinse thoroughly. Thank you. Get that sugar out. Get it out, get it out. Yes, you can put the bread back if you want in the bag. Okay, after you've rinsed thoroughly, then I'm sorry these crackers are a bit tough so be careful I don't want any broken teeth right so please carefully maybe you should use your molars and not your incisors on this one right or molars and premolars do you have any results here yet yeah go ahead Let's start with sugar this time, right? We're testing for sugar. Zero, 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 one. Okay? So many people couldn't be wrong. All right. Okay, rinse again, and we're going to go for salt. If you don't remember, you can go again for the salt, right? But think about it. Think about it. Okay, we're ready again. Mr. Latte, what, what have you got? Four. Four for salt. Three. Two. Two. Three. Two. Zero. One. One. Two. Okay. Now, I'd like the persons who were rec rec recording to do an average for each of these results. Okay? 
All right. Um, and while they're doing the average, I'd like someone from this group on this stage to tell us what they think I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And if it's done properly, or you, do you see any shortcomings in this procedure? Okay, so I think your point is trying to say that the salt or sugar content into dry foods might not be as high as moist foods. Yes, that's part of the story. Anyone? Uh, not sure about this one, but I think the actual levels of salt and sugar in either the crackers or the bread may be higher than what we perceive them to be. Thank you, sir. I, that's, that's, that's very, very um, thought-provoking. All right. Which do you think was saltier? I, the consensus is that the bread was salty. And I'm going to ask again, <clears throat> a consensus I get, how much more salty was the bread than the crackers? Could we get an average? What do we get? Three, three times more? Or four times more? Two to three times more. That's, all, that's what I'm getting. Two to three times more. Okay? Our scribes down there, what did you get? Give her the mic, please. So for bread, the average for salt was 6.15. The average for sugar for bread was 3.7. For the crackers, the average for salt was 2. And the average for sugar was 0.1. So we're getting a 3 times average for salt in the Two. bread. So the bread is as 3 times as much salt as the crackers. Is that what you're saying? Mm-hmm. Okay. And so the sugar in the bread... It's not Three changing times. anything. Three times more than that in the cracker. Right. Okay. Now, uh, when I was little, my father told me that if you're cooking and you have too much salt in it, put some sugar in it, and it will seem like the salt is lower in content. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you the salt content on these products right now. Mr. Rose, people may think I'm... Bias, but as well, let Mr. Rose read it. Salt in this is 300, the sodium that is 370 milligrams, and the sugars in. Please stick with the salt first. Right. And give me a percentage that they've got on here. It's 18, 19% of your daily intake. It, what? what? 19%. Is it 15 or 15, actually, yeah. This has got 15%. The crackers is actually 100 um, milligrams. And it's 4%. Okay. All right. So, uh, why, am, why am I doing this? Because. We are a country that leads the world in cardiovascular disease, or leads a large part of the world. All right? Yesterday, when I bought this bread in the, at the bakery, I bought the whole wheat first, and it was saying 9%. And then I went and asked for the white bread. And it was 15% sodium, 15%, right? 
And this is way above the daily recommended allowance for those with high blood pressure. Far, far above. Okay? So, even though it has the sugar in it, as I said before, that was maybe an attempt to mask the amount of sugar, the amount of salt in it. This company is trying to preserve a particular taste in the white bread. Notice it's not in the wheat bread. But they've been making white bread from 1953, that, that bakery. And they want to maintain that. Never mind that the, so the sodium is way over the health threshold for uh, patient people with this complaint, especially in Jamaica. The profits must be maintained. Okay? So I thank you very much for coming and confirming what is recorded there. And some of you, this is a serious matter because there are NCU students now, and I hate to say it this way because it probably will bring up memories, but there are NCU students right now whose relatives have passed away because of products like this bread. Okay? Because it builds up in the daytime when you have a lot of it. As it is, you shouldn't be eating more than five slices of this per day if you're hypertensive. And there are many who do that, who eat more than that. So I want to thank you very much for coming and confirming what I had suspected all along. Thank you very much. And so now I have to rush through my presentation. As I was told by Dr. Ziminis that I have 10 minutes and, um, you know, so I have to, uh, you know, fall in line. All right, so seven minutes now. Thank you, Jano. You're even worse. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so um, why do, are we talking about initial solar dehydration of biomass? Why are we doing that? Because if we want to bring down uh, global warming, if we want to reduce the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we are going to have to find a way to stop putting it, to reduce the uh, amount pushed up. And one, the gr one of the greatest ways of bringing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere is decomposition of organic matter in the ground. Dead leaves, trees, twigs, dead animals, what have you. This decomposition, as you know, I don't have to tell you that. So how can you change this process over? The process is called pyrolysis biochar, uh, in particular, torrefaction of biomass. But the problem is that it takes a lot of energy. And so we want to reduce the amount of energy for this uh, pyrolysis. Pyrolysis, things that are pyrolyzed, uh, can remain as charcoal for hundreds or thousands of years in the ground without turning into carbon dioxide. So, one prime candidate is foods, food scraps. Potato peels, yam peels, uh, what have you. Pyrolyze them. But we have a problem. So, the largest source of uh, energy um, demand is in dehydrating the foods before they reach the pyrolysis stage. Removing water is, as you know, water uh, has a very high heat capacity. So therefore, you put a lot of heat in that water, it's not, it's not, going, it's not going anywhere, you know, so, we, so that's the problem. And how can we dehydrate it 
uh, without using any fossil fuels. We can do it, I think you know what I'm going to say, by um, solar uh, dehydration. All right? Okay. So, it sounds like a very simple uh, explanation, but wait until you see the figures coming up. All right. So, we have uh, done that. Okay, you can read that. So even if fuels facilitate pyrolysis, the last paragraph, carbon thus converted from biomass never gets back into the atmosphere for thousands of years. And the definition is to uh, heat in anoxic conditions because no carbon dioxide from come can come if there is no oxygen. So you are heating without oxygen. Okay? All right? So our hypothesis is that solar energy can decrease CO2 released in biochar production. Torrefaction is a mild form of pyrolysis uh, at between 200 and 320 degrees centigrade. So you're going to... This is what I did when I was overseas recently. I pyrolyzed food peelings in my car. It was 25 degrees outside, but inside that car it was 40 degrees because the infrared is not leaving from inside, okay? And uh, all kinds of peels, banana peels, carrot peels, what have you. What if everybody did that in their car? You would bring down a lot of fossil fuels. Uh, being used for carbon dioxide. Uh, you, it, this is the idea here. Uh, we have the cold air coming in. Uh, this is not the car this time. This is the uh, actual contraption that you can also use. And the hot air goes out the top there, right? But in the car, it's going to be faster because the hot air is not coming out. Okay. Uh, so what I did, I weighed the samples before and kept them in the car for one, two, three hours. Uh, and then I had an oven, all right, a wood oven, and I closed the door of the oven so no oxygen could get in, and I slowly subjected them after taking them from the car dashboard and putting them at less than 250 degrees. And let's see what happened. Look at the last paragraph. There was a small change in size between the dashboard hydrated samples and that of torrefaction without the dehydration. You can see the raw banana peels on the left. And that, that was dashboard pretreated on the left, uh, in the middle. And then that which was torrefacted, that one was uh, torrefacted, um, uh, all right? So you can see the difference between the middle and the last one. Even though, even though the one on the right was torrefacted uh, from scratch, the dashboard treated one is not that much different from the torrefacted one. And it's not even been in the oven yet. And the weight is not that much different because it's the water that was causing the weight. All right. So the results are, look at the times, look at the times. The biochar at less than 250 degrees centigrade took three minutes, took three minutes after dehydration, all right? And those which were not dehydrated, you put the raw banana peels in the pyrolyzer, in the oven, and it took 50, 50 minutes to be torrefacted. So we're having a time 17 to 1. That's the amount of fuel that you're using to
sorry fat if you don't dehydrate uh, using solar power. With such a low co conclusion, with such a low water content, there would have been no need for startup fuel as the dashboard DS treatment lowered the kindling temperature. The dashboard treated biomass, last paragraph, in sufficient quantities would be its own startup fuel. Okay? And let me talk about startup fuel now. That oven had to be started up with wood. If you, tar if, if you treat it in the dashboard, you don't need wood. It starts its kindling temperature uh, very much lower than otherwise. So we're getting rid of all that startup fuel, thereby avoiding the need for any fossil fuel in the process. I did that. I, was over, I did it overseas, and I'm telling you, that's what happened. And torrefaction of biomass by pyrolysis may include disease-producing foods. <laughs> Example, high-sodium bread. We should torrefact them, and we should not eat them. Thank you very much. I'm sorry if some of the bakery owners are here. My apologies. You have a question? Thank you, Doc Professor. I am an avid gardener, and I like to use the scraps from my kitchen as my compost in my garden. So am I doing something wrong, or should I do something differently with it before I put it in my garden? I didn't get the first part. I'm sorry. I say, I'm just saying I'm an avid gardener. Yeah. I like to plant things. And I use the scraps from my kitchen, you, you, uh, yeah, the scraps from my kitchen yeah. as compost. So am I doing it incorrectly or what should I do differently having listened to your presentation? <laughs> All right. Okay. So you're trying to trap me, right? <laughs> okay. 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 Well, you're going to need the organic matter to grow your vegetables. All right. But that which you do not need to grow your vegetables, because you've got to eat, all right? Even though I know you're a rich man, you don't need a garden, but you've got to eat. So we have got to eat. I'm just joking, sir. So uh, you have, that's the best way to, 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 to grow things, uh, by, by, by decomposition. There are things that we must do. But I'm talking about the people who throw it in the garbage and send it to the garbage dump. That's what I'm talking about. They could be... Uh, torrefacted. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Dr. Harris. I'll try to be as short as possible. I don't have much. So, um, in adding on to what Dr. Harris was um, presenting, um, because I've been looking at solar dehydration for a few years, so this dehydrator that I built here is my third model. And so, what, what I was thinking about is a friend who said he spent about he had, his bill was $4,000 at home, and he bought an electric dehydrator, and he used it to dry peppers, and then after he did his drying of peppers, his bill went from $4,000 to $14,000 per month. So he was concerned as to you know, how much money he would have to spend in terms of every month just running this thing, because it takes about maybe 12 to 30 hours to dry a sample. So what, I was, what I'm looking at is utilizing small-scale solar dehydration to reduce the energy bill associated with modern household electrical dehydration. So a solar dehydration, of course, as Dr. Harris said, is just a, a method of removing moisture from food. Some, have it, some foods have it in them more than others. And the faster you can get it out is the more it becomes hardened and it's easier to store. <clears throat> So there are three types of dehydrators that are currently the solar ones that are used. And the one that I am designing is, the, is called the updraft solar dehydrator. So updraft means you pull in air, it heats up this, the, the um, collector, which is that thing that you see sloping down to the ground. And then 
the air is pulled up into it and falls down through the food items, pulling the moisture out, and then it goes up through a chimney at the back. It goes up through a chimney at the back, and that chimney at the back will get rid of the, the moisture and the heat, and it, it functions in that way. The second type is called the updraft. This is the one that people usually build, and that just simply, again, the same principle, heats up the air, the air goes up, and it goes up through the food and then escapes at the top through a chimney. Now the updraft dehydrator, sometimes they said the problem associated with the updraft dehydrator is that it tends to, as it's collecting moisture going up, it'll cool down and so the heat has a problem getting out. Um, the third type is the one that Dr. Harris used in his study, which is like using your dashboard where the sun directly, heat, um, directly heats the food items. Many people in Jamaica have been doing this for a long time. You know, you, you want to dry some cassava, you grater it, you put it out and spread it out in a, in a metal pan or something, you put it out in the sun and it dries. So that is direct um, solar dehydration. The problem with that one is that the sun energy tends to pull out a lot of things besides moisture from it. So a lot of the nutrition is lost when you use the, the um, direct dehydration. So, of course, in looking at a, a, um, <clears throat> a presentation by Good Housekeeping, they were saying the, the new methods of drying food using the electrical ones, which is growing in popularity. If you go on Amazon right now and you just type in um, electric dehydrators, you will see hundreds of them ranging from 20 something dollars to maybe two, three, four hundred dollars, depending on, on the size and what it's capable of, how many watts it uses. And the, so the problem is that sometimes the material at the bottom dries out and the one at the top is not dry and then they have to keep rotating it and so there are some issues if you just leave it to run for the period. Another problem is that it, um, the results show that 0.15 kilowatts to 0.55 kilowatts over the course of one hour is usually used in um, electric dehydration. So I went to Price Mart, for example, and they have this oven, and instead of them making just ovens um, as they used to, now they're making ovens, air dryers combined. And this one, as you can see, it actually is a 13-in-1, it's a ninja, but you have others. So it does air frying, air roasting, bake, broil, toast, bagel, reheat, and dehydrate, and that's just one menu. It also has the regular baking menu on the other side. So, so many people actually are having these types of dehydrators already in their houses. Or you would have had a convection oven in your house already. So you already have the means to dry a convection oven. It means you can put it on convection and it blows heat through the food and heats it and pulls out the moisture. <clears throat> so the, the, the concept is we start by building something like this for you to have in your yard, so you put your food items in it on the trays, as you can see, you know, just like how they, it has trays inside, rolls to put trays on. And so this is just pre-dehydration. So what you're doing is putting it out there for maybe a day, you, you can pull it back in the house, put it out the next day. So let's say you go to work or you go to school, you put it out in the yard. By the time you come back, a lot of the moisture would have been removed. After maybe one or two days, you would have removed as much as maybe 70%, 60 to 70% of the moisture in the food items. Then if you want to further dehydrate it and remove the majority, you transfer it now to the electrical. So rather than using maybe 12 or 30 hours, you have cut your time to maybe just an hour or two. And the results would be pretty much the same. Um, so a, a simple method, nobody has it on the screen. All right. So on the, on the left in the presentation, you would see my, that is that side, you'd see my dehydrator, which is a downdraft, and on the right you would see the electrical one. So we start with the dehydrator using the solar energy, which is readily available, and then shift it to the electrical, and then you can get better results and use less time and use less electricity. Um, so. Um, so just showing you some of the models I've built, that was my first one on the left, and that went, I had it out there for about three years, and it was made of wood, but after a while it deteriorated. The second one I built, but I made the box too big and the collector too small, so it didn't get to generate enough heat to cause effective drying. And the third one is the one I'm doing now with a bigger collector, 
a smaller space to dry the food and a smaller exit for the um, vent. <clears throat> so just to show you this in practice, I actually do a lot of baking and some people call my, my cooking experiments. Everything I do is an experiment. I believe I'm a scientist, so I should do it in the kitchen. <laughs> so when I'm in the kitchen, I actually said, you know, I need to make banana bread from banana. So I actually took these three items. I took the sweet potato, the green plantain, and the green banana, and put them in my dehydrator, dried them out. That's just using solar energy. It took about three days. And then when I got the results that you're seeing here, I used a magic bullet, turned that into flour. When I got the flour now, the next step was to bake it. So I actually used the same amount of the flour from each, the same amount of bananas, the same amount of coconut, everything I did from each to see if the experiment would work. And I baked banana breads from three of the, the flours, only I didn't add in any counter flour or any other flour, just the, the flour as it was. And then when I baked it, I ended up with these um, four. One of them, you'll see, actually has the three in, in, the, in the one. I just poured them separately in, but they bake together. Now, which one do you think of these three was tasted the best and had the best result like flour? Which one? Anyone want to? Banana? Sweet potato? Okay, well, um, based on my scientific evidence, <laughs> Um, the planting actually was more like the counter flower than the others. Actually, it was, it was probably the same or better. It had the same consistency. It almost had the same results as if you were baking with counter flour. And so these are some shots. I don't know if you can see them of what it looks inside. And then um, I actually ate them. All right? So... <laughs> Yes, you have to eat the evidence. You have to eat the results. <laughs> you have to get results. So I, I could just tell you this, that if individuals want to go the route of dehydration first, or pre-dehydration, and then electrical dehydration, they could save themselves a, a lot of time, a lot of energy, and a lot of money. Thank you. That's the end of my presentation. All right, I want to thank Mr. Rose and Professor Harris for the wonderful presentation. At this time, I'm going to call Mr. Miller to come forward to do the closing of this wonderful ceremony that we have had from morning till now. And we, at this time, we are looking forward to next year when we will be bigger and better. And also for new persons to come in with other research and innovations that they have done so that we can prevent, present them to the university and to the public at large. Once more, we thank you for, your, for being here, and I now turn over to Mr. Miller. Okay, good afternoon again. So, you are faithful to the end. Thank you for being so. And at this point, there's not much for me to say, but to uh, thank persons who have been here and for the persons who have made their contribution uh, in making today possible. And at this point, I want to thank my co-chair, Dr. Ziminez. Uh, you can come forward, Dr. Ziminez. <clears throat> for years I've been doing this alone. It's good to have a co-chair and it came out of necessity, but it was a very good addition to the team. And we thank Dr. Zimenez for coming in and being very instrumental, right? This year she did uh, most of the work, I, I, I must advise, because uh, that was the word that I used most of the time. I was giving advice while she was doing the work. So we thank Dr. Zimenez for her contribution. We thank the presenter, our keynote presenter, Dr. Hughes, and our other presenters who are here. Let's give the presenters a round of applause, please. Also, we had the very interesting presentation of shells and rocks from Dr. Errol Miller from the Samuel McClement Museum. We thank the persons from the Department of Biology, Dr. White, Mrs. Roberts, and the team, faculty, and staff, the college dean, Dr. Uh, Professor Vincent Wright, and uh, Mrs. Parchment, and the team from the dean's office. 
Also the research office, Dr. Frankson, who chaired the research committee overall, and Ms. Tawana Simpson, uh, who was very instrumental as well as the administrative assistant. CCMPR, CCMPR. We thank uh, Mr. Miss, Miss Smith, who is over there. Thank you, Mrs. Miss Smith. And Mr. Buckley and team. Uh, you make this thing possible. You make Jamaica and the world uh, aware of what we're doing here, and we are very grateful for that. And the media team, Mr. Johnson or Jano, and uh, Mr. Lawrence is up there. If I try to see Mr. Lawrence, I might get blind this afternoon from those bright lights. But Mr. Lawrence and team are up there, and we thank you very much. Special events, Mrs. Cook and her team, and we have uh, an external person from uh, Jam Labs, and we're going to invite Mr. Darren Braithwaite to come forward from Jam Labs. Jam Labs came on board, and they left some gifts for us and some sponsorship, which persons from the poster competition will benefit from later on. But I'm just going to ask Dr. Ziminis to present Mr. Darren Braithwaite with a token of our, our appreciation and looking forward to have you again, uh, Mr. Braithwaite, in the future. And we hope that we'll develop a stronger relationship and we can get you some sales of some very expensive equipment that NCU needs and we'll seek the sponsorship uh, to get that done. We also thank the session. Thank you again. Let me, thank you, sir. Right? I, and looking forward to having you back. We also thank the session chairs. Uh, we thank Professor Max Wellington. We also thank Mr. Foster uh, for their role today in making this very possible. We also thank, this is a research week event, so we thank the research office. I see Professor Giles over there. So thank you, Professor Giles. Thank you, everyone. And most of all, we thank our audience. Thank you for making it possible. Thank you for seeing what has been done here. Those persons in person who have been here in person, those persons who are online, we thank you all. And so we now bring down the curtain on Science Symposium 2024. And this is the 24th year of Science Symposium. So next year, we'll be going what? A quarter of a century. That is no mean feat. And next year, uh, we're going to have to have some award for those persons who have been here. Professor Giles, Science Symposium is your brainchild. So next year, we need to have you and present you with some Lifetime Achievement Award for Science Symposium, sir. A tangible gift. So looking forward to seeing you there. And thank you again. And God be with you. Have a blessed evening. <laughs>